Am I supposed to come up there? No. Come on up, baby. <laughs> come on up, baby. I was kind of waiting for everybody to sit down, but I just wanted to make sure everybody was in the room to hear, hear Amy. Um, Amy Jones moved to Arizona from Wisconsin in 2001. She and her husband, TJ, have been members of the Crossroads family right here since 2004. Amy is the founder of Chandler's number one real estate team, the Amy Jones Group. And she is willing to be here today um, to tell her story. Um, several days, months ago, I don't know how many months ago, um, Joyce and I were talking about this particular inspiration. And I had just heard a little bit about Amy's story and not even a whole lot, but I really believe that God had orchestrated this days and months and months ago. And I believe she has got an amazing story to tell. Since then, I have heard it. She's told Kendall and I her story, and it, 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 she's impacting lives already. And so today, please welcome Amy, and we're anxious to hear what you have to share. Hello. So nice to see all of you. My husband and I um, moved up to Pine Top in June. This is really loud. Um, moved up to Pine Top in June, so I have missed all of you. Um, and I gotta get back to my notes because I don't talk like she does and like just from memory. Um, so really it's nothing short of a miracle that I'm here today. Um, all my life, I, well at least for the last few years, I have felt there was something I was supposed to do. And um, this, about six months ago actually, I came to the end of myself. Um, I've been feeling the stirring in my soul. It grew, it grew, it grew uh, with tremendous discontent. Um, I was extremely blessed. Is it okay? Yeah, everything's okay? Okay. <laughs> I was extremely blessed. Uh, from outward appearances, everything was great, but inside I felt like I was suffocating. Um, I was putting on a happy face. I felt like I was homesick for a place I'd never been, and I didn't know how to fix that. Um, so one day, coming to the end of myself, my husband said, well, why don't you go for a walk with your Jesus music, because that always makes you feel better. So that's what I did. <laughs> I started to walk, and I started to plead with God. Um, Please answer me. I have been praying for two or three years, and I ha can't hear you. You're not answering me anymore. And he was always very good at answering me. And in that moment, like an electrical current went through my body, um, I heard him say, I've already told you what I want you to do. And in that moment of him saying that, I knew what I was supposed to do. There was no more question. For years, people have said, Amy, you need to tell your story. You need to write a book. You need to tell your, your story. And every time I'd hear it, I'd say, someday, when I'm not so busy, I'm running this real estate business, and you know, maybe when I retire, I'll go up and write. And Well, God didn't want to maybe someday. I went home and told my husband, this is it, this is what I'm supposed to do, I know what I'm supposed to do. We are going to get out of the real estate business and we're selling our house and everything in it and we're moving to the mountain where I can write. Well, he was silent for a little while. <laughs> but he, he knew my heart and he knew that I had been really struggling with that for some time. Now, God had already provided for this, because four years ago, God brought Mindy, TJ's daughter, to our real estate team. Say hi, Mindy. Yeah. And uh, out of the blue, she was a very successful businesswoman, and she said, I would like to join your team and learn how to sell real estate, and she excelled, and she flew with it, and so she took over our business. Um, God had already provided for that. When I was asked today, right after that happened, which was, I will tell you, exactly six months ago today, on April 7th, um, when I was asked to tell my story, I said immediately yes, because when I tell your story, God told me, tell my story, so I'm going to tell my story. But then I said, oh my goodness, God, really, you know, I would rather poke my eyes out than talk, stand up <laughs> and talk in front of people. This is not my forte. Anyone who knows that I have been asked to speak anywhere with respect to real estate knows that I would be physically ill and feel like I had to go to the emergency room with a heart attack because it's not my forte. 
Um, but God has given me a sense of peace. And uh, every day I walk and I listen and we talk and I listen to my Jesus music. And uh, he tells me exactly what to say. And of course, I've told my story uh, many, many, many times. And I forget I had this, so this is it. Tell your story. I missed that slide. So when, while I was walking, one of the things he made clear to me was it was more, I knew that my adoption story would take center stage. Um, but he wanted me to share with you, I feel, um, the story of miracles. Because I just think that we as, as a nation, as a world, have lost the ability to see his miracles in our lives. This picture up here, if you can see it, that's me and my mom and my grandma. And this was taken about a year before a tragic car accident. Uh, my mom was driving. My grandma Amy, who I was named after, uh, was holding me. This was before car seat laws. And uh, I was 14 months old. And we went through an intersection on a busy highway, and a lady ran a red light and hit us. It flipped our car over, and we spun around. Uh, grandma went into the culvert on the right, and my mom went on the culvert on the left. My mom spent four months in the hospital. Her teeth went through her lips. She had five compound fractures of her pelvis, and her spine was crushed. My grandma died three days later. I flew through the air and landed on top of my mother. How does that happen? All my life, I told my daughters, you know, God spared me. Now, I am no one. I don't even have a college education, so clearly, you have something important to do. This is why he spared me, but maybe for a time such as this. Huh? So <clears throat> here's the thing. I tell people my stories, and I've had a lot of miracles in my life. And most of the time, they say, oh, wow, you know, I've never really had any miracles in my life. Um, my life has been pretty unremarkable. And I think the most unremarkable life is the most life, the life most filled with miracles, because God is working behind the scenes in your life. He is those, those forgotten cell phones that keep you delayed by two seconds that irritate you, changes to your schedule, that keep you from being in the middle of that intersection when that car is running the red light. So I would invite you today to recognize those and thank God every day for what he's done in your life. Now, I just turned it off, and I turned it back on. <laughs> um, Every person in this room, though, has been has experienced the biggest miracle in the world was uh, it's your birth, right? From conception, gestation, all the things that have to happen so that you can be sitting here today. Well, for thousands of babies, I don't know if you can see this, but there are about 40 to 50 million abortions a year over the world. That's about 125,000 lives taken every single day. So for these babies, for whatever million different reasons there are, their life is not thought of as a miracle. They are not, they are not thought of as a blessing. They're not, their existence is not a cause for celebration. And I was one of those babies. I was adopted at birth, and I've known this since I was three years old. And I was also blessed to have two of the most wonderful people in the world adopt me. This is my mom and dad. And when I'm talking about my mom and dad through this story, it's these people that I'm talking about. On my 12th Christmas, my mom and dad gave me a picture of my mom and my birth brother, Tim, who I found out was two years older than me. This is my birth mother. And up until this, the 12 Christmas, I had never seen their faces, so it made it very real for me. I'd always heard the story. Um, Gail was renting an apartment with her husband and her little boy from my, my mom, who was managing an apartment complex while my dad was in the Navy in San Diego. One day, Gail came over to their house and asked to use their phone. She said that her and her husband were going to be getting a divorce. He was going to be getting out of the Navy. She wouldn't be getting any support. So she had decided to put her baby up for adoption. She was going home to live with her, her mother. She couldn't take two babies home. And uh, she wanted to call her doctor. So that night, my mom and dad talked, and they went over to Gail's apartment and um, said that they would like to adopt her baby. And that's exactly what happened. A few months later, um, she, she, uh, they adopted me February 1959. Now when I had two daughters of my own, I realized a part of their story was missing. I had always asked my mom, what did, uh, what happened, you know, did you ever hear from Gail again? And no, no, never heard in fact. 
uh, when we were about, you were about three weeks, well, about three months after we got back to Illinois where they moved when my dad was transferred, I was three months old, um, we got a call that Gail had died. And I said, wow, you know, this is as I'm older, not when I was three. <laughs> <laughs> what did she die from? And my mom would always say she died of a broken heart. Mm -hmm. And that's the only that's the only answer I had. Now, when I had my two little girls, I thought, who dies from a broken heart? Like all of a sudden, I'm 22 years old, and I'm thinking, up until then, I had no questions. But I thought, if she really did die, there's probably some medical issues we may need to know about, or mental health issues. Um, so I was really curious, and I so I went down and I talked to my mom and dad, and I said, you know. I'm thinking about going and looking for my brother, who was two years older than me. He would have been 24 at the time. So do you know where Gail was from so that maybe I could find Timmy? And my dad said, oh, she was from Globe, I think, Globe, Arizona. And I remember I'm living in Wisconsin, and uh, Arizona's a long way away, and I'd never heard of Globe. And, uh, and so I went and got an atlas. This was 1981. <laughs> and I looked up Globe, and my mother said to me at the time, and I saw her shoot in the stink eye, so I knew something was up. And she said, um, well, if you find, I said, I, I would really like to find Timmy. And she said, well, if you find your brother, you'll probably find your mother. And I said, I know. And that was all that was ever said about it. And I understood the deception, because back then, an adoption wasn't final for six months. And she was, my mother was terrified that she, that Gail would come back and try to get me back. It was a private adoption. She knew they were moving to Illinois and, you know, this whole thing. So, so I understood it and we never talked about it again. So I decided that I would go and look for Gail and I joined an adoption support group. And they gave you all kinds of tips on how to find your birth mother, what, where, how to look things to do, always keep her secret because you never know who would, you know, you may be talking to someone who knows her and nobody knows, a husband, kids, whatever. Um, and for me, the biggest thing was, and if and when you find her and you make the first phone call, make sure she takes down your phone number because the first instinct she'll have is to hang up the phone and you will feel rejected again, you won't call her back, and she won't know how to get a hold of you again before caller ID, but before cell phones, right? So in October 1981, October's a big month, isn't it? Here I am. October 1981, when I was 22 years old, I was on my way to Globe, Arizona. Now I have to tell you, this is my little daddy. And when he dropped me off at the airport to go look for her, I see this because I miss him so much. The doubts just started creeping in. And was I doing the right thing? I loved my parents and I didn't want them to think that I was leaving them or replacing them or didn't appreciate them or didn't love them. And the whole flight, I kept seeing him and I was just beside myself. I wasn't big into prayer then. And I kept hoping, please don't let the plane go down. Please don't let him die before I get home. I really want to find Gail, but I really want to go back and so they'll know that they're never going to be replaced. And I want them to know I love them. So arriving in Arizona, I went right to Globe High School because my parents had given me these four pictures and one of them was a high school yearbook photo and it said 1955-56 on it. And on the back of it, it said, To Sally in my birth mother's handwriting and this is a picture she had given to them to give to me so i went into the globe high school looking i didn't have her maiden name i only had her married name which was bender but i had gail g-a-y-l-e and i had her face so i pulled the 1955 56 yearbooks and i sat on that those steps in, in globe and i looked for her face and it wasn't there and I was so disappointed. I didn't have a lot of money and I had flown to Arizona to find her with one clue. I don't know why I thought that I could do that, but I thought I had all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know what to do at this point. So driving back to Mesa where I was staying, we passed the Chamber of Commerce and begrudgingly stopped to pick up some travel brochures, even though in my mind this was not a vacation. 
And that was exactly the last thing I wanted to do was go sightseeing. I was there to find my birth mother. And I went in and I started talking in this little room and there was one lady sitting in there. And I started telling her the story about my name, my mom was Sally, and I'm Sally, because that was the name on the back of the picture, right? <laughs> so I was making this story, and Sally was my, was had a friend who was from Globe, and uh, her name was Gail Bender when she got married, and my mom gave, my mom Sally's dying wish was that I would find her. What a lie. But it was, <laughs> I was keeping her secret, and uh, the lady said, well, you know, I don't, I don't write, she said, I'm from here, and she says, I grew up here, and she said, I went to school in those years. She said, so let me ask around, what's your phone number, and I will call you if I hear anything. Well, I left there with my brochures, thinking that would be the last I'd ever hear from her. And that night, I prayed. I think it was probably the first time I ever truly prayed. And I can remember laying in the bed saying, okay, God, if you want me to find her, you have to give me another clue, because I am out of clues. But if you don't give me another clue, that I'll just assume that I'm not supposed to find her, that this is what you want me to do, is go home and be done with this and never think about it again. Well, the next morning, the phone rang, and it was a lady from the Chamber of Commerce. And she says, you know, there's a vendor family that lives in Superior. Why don't you try Superior? Well, I thought, wow, is this God? No, 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 this, this is just a coincidence. This is just a coincidence. <laughs> So I was on my way to Superior. Now one of the pictures they had given me was this one. And I don't know if you've ever been through Superior, but you see that little smokestack over there on the left-hand side. Um, as I went around the corner into Superior, I saw the smokestack. Now I had passed through Superior to get to Globe, but never noticed it. And I thought for sure I had found her. So I went up to the Superior High School. That's actually me in 1981, standing up there with my folder of notes, <laughs> and I uh, went in and I said, I would like to see your yearbooks from 1955 and 56, and they said they all burned in a fire several years ago. Aww. As the color drained from my face <laughs> and my knees got weak, weak uh, a lady walked out of the back room and she looked like she was in her 70s, and she said, can I help you? And I said, well, I've got this friend of my mom's and I started to tell her and she took the phone and she said well that looks like Gail Beatty and I heard the name and I didn't say a word and she went over to a file file cabinet and pulled out a file folder and there stapled across the top were the four photos of my birth mom one that matched the photo that I held in my hand and she said oh come on back to my office let's talk and so I did and uh, she says Okay, now you can tell me this is your mother, isn't it? And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, my mom's Sally. And I started to the story. And she said, honey, get a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> now that I look at this, I don't know who I thought I was fooling, really. So the gig was up. And I told Betty all about uh, my, my search. And uh, she actually said, you know what? Um, your mom's brother, Jerry, just moved from Superior. His son, his youngest son, just graduated from high school. She went and got a file. She said, here's his number. Uh, give him a call. And uh, I left that building that day, clutching that number, went down the hill to a little grocery store, and there was a pay phone. <laughs> and uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to talk to my first, the first time I've talked to a blood relative, you know? So I called him and I said, um, he answered, real southern kind of drawl, and I said, uh, Jerry, this is Sally. Sally had got a lot of play that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, you know, I, I was a friend of your sister's, I'm over here in Superior, Betty at the high school said you might know where she is. Oh yeah, yeah, she's living over there in Tempe with mom. Here's her number. So I went back down to Mesa, because I wanted to pull my thoughts together and look over my notes and try to figure out how I was gonna get her to take down my phone number before she hung up on me. And uh, I paced, I paced and paced, and then I made the call. And the phone rang and she answered and I said, uh, hello, is this Gail? And she said, yes, it is. And I said, Gail, this is a really important phone call. Uh, could you take down my number in case we get disconnected? 
and I waited for the click. And she said, sure, in just a minute. She took down my number and I said, um, does February 27th mean any, February 27th, 1959 mean anything to you? And she said, long pause, and I'm dying. And she said, no. And I said, oh, okay, well, does the name Amy Robin mean anything to you? Because she named me what they had asked her to name me. And there was a long pause, felt like an eternity, and she said, yes. And I said, well, this is Amy, and I just called to thank you. And she said, for what? I said, for having me, you didn't have to do that. And she waited, and she said, where are you? I said, oh, I'm over here at my sister-in-law's house, which told her nothing. <laughs> and she said, I'd like to see you. And I said, you would, because that was not a scenario that had ever played out in my mind. Every single scenario I thought of was her hanging up on me, saying, don't ever call me again. What are you doing? And I said, and she covered the phone, and she said, mom, it's my daughter. She'd like to see me. Should I have her come here or meet her somewhere else? And then I heard my grandmother's voice, and I'll never forget it. She said, my God, child, that's my granddaughter. Bring her over here. <laughs> <laughs> and so within an hour, I was pulling up to her house in Tempe. She was standing out in front of the, out of the, out in front of the driveway, and I'd always pictured her so much different because I struggled with weight my whole life, and I thought she was going to be a great, big, heavy woman. And she was tall and thin and blonde, and I had actually dyed my hair back to its natural color because I'd been blonde all my life, and, and she was bleached blonde too. But there she was, standing there. And I got out of the car and, and uh, walked up to her, and she threw her arms around me and said, um, I knew my God would bring you back to me. Oh, wow. That's the first words she said to me. So I went into the house, and I met my grandmother, who was nothing like I pictured either. I pictured her like a big Viking woman with horns on her head <laughs> <laughs> all my life. Because in my mind, all I heard was, Gail couldn't take me home to live with her mother. And so she was the one I was, you know, making the evil one. Even though my life was wonderful, I wouldn't have had it any other way. So we sat there and we talked till the wee hours of the morning. We laughed about my hair color. Um, she had the same curtains in her bedroom. She had the same eyeglass frames that I had. Um, she said the same things I did. She finished my sentences and it was something I had never, ever experienced. And for the first time, I got to hear my, my adoption story. And um, she was married. She had her little boy and her husband was out to sea. He was in the Navy, and she went home to Superior to her sister's high school graduation party and met a boy, and they spent one night together. Um, bad decision on her part, good decision on my part. <laughs> she never saw him again. She said, you have his eyes. Her eyes are brown, my eyes are blue. She said he had very blue eyes, he was tall and handsome, and his name was Robert Neff, but that's all she knew and she never saw him again. Three months later, she realized she was pregnant. And now what do you do? Your husband was gone. There's no way the baby is his. So her friends told her she should take a lot of hot baths and jump off the refrigerator over <laughs> and over and over again. <laughs> Self-induced miscarriage, I guess, I don't know. And if that didn't work, they had people who could help her end her pregnancy, and me. But after much consideration, she decided to tell her husband that she was pregnant. And of course, the marriage failed at that point. And she's decided to put me up for adoption. The rest, as they say, is history. Um, over the years, she told me that she suffered severe depression, especially around my birthday. Um, no matter how many times I told her how much I loved my life and how happy I was she'd made that decision and how I wouldn't want to change anything, it's no offense to you, Gail, but I wouldn't want it any other way, she still felt enormous guilt and she would bring it up again and again. I still feel so guilty that I gave you away. And one day, it's ironic or ironic or miraculous that uh, you mentioned about Jesus and Moses. I had never thought about it. And in that moment, we're sitting at Red Robin, and she said, oh, I still feel so guilty that I gave you away. 
And I said, and she loved Jesus, and she loved the Lord, and I said, but Jesus was adopted. And she just looked at me, and I'm thinking, where is this coming from? Because I had never really thought about it before. And, I, and she said, what? And I said, well, Jesus was adopted, right? Didn't Joseph adopt Jesus? So if it's good enough for God, it's okay that you gave him up for adoption. And she never once again mentioned it. I went back several times. Those are my two brothers who didn't know I existed either until she told them that I had found her. Tim is the older one on the left there, and then my giant six foot nine brother on the right. Gail had remarried soon after I was born and tried to get me back. My adoption was final three days prior. Wow. Praise God. Over the years, even my parents built a friendship with her. That's her with my mom and her with my dad. We had a good life. After my mom died in 2001, my dad, um, my dad moved in with me and we moved from Wisconsin here to Arizona to escape the winters. And uh, I got to know Gail better and dad got to golf. He was happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last year, 35 years after I found my birth mother, I found my birth father. Um, the day I found him was the day that Gail forgot my name because she was suffering from Alzheimer's. Aww. And I just had to think, you know, God's timing is so perfect, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now that's another story for another day because I only have 30 minutes, so. Um, you can read my book. <laughs> um, but I do have a little clip of the first time I met him. Oh, there's no sound. Again? Oops. <laughs> oh. Oh. Did anything get unplugged or anything? I could always stick it up here and play it with the computer. Because it wasn't working earlier. It was working earlier. No? Now let's try it. Well, that's music. <laughs> there it is. I'm here at all. I can't come out. I'm video chasing so. Took you long enough to find him. I know. I'm actually going to see him tomorrow as a surprise. It was his 83rd birthday yesterday, so Aww. he lives up in Laughlin, so. But a whole series of miracles um, of how he even came to be in the globe that day. And I call them miracles, even though the circumstances weren't exactly what people were think of as good. I'm living proof that God takes everything mm. and makes something good out of it. Mm. Yeah. And that's the proof right there. Mm -hmm. So today I'm thankful for the parents who gave me life mm -hmm. and the parents who gave me something to live for. I was also blessed to have my little daddy live with me for the last seven years of his life before he died in 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a little video that I created with the help of my daughter and my granddaughter, who is three, who is narrating. I'm really proud of her. Um, my daughter and granddaughter who live in Houston, so they're not here today. And I created this as a tribute to my birth mom, and actually birth moms everywhere. Um, she died two months ago uh, from her Alzheimer's on August 11th, after a six-year battle with Alzheimer's, but she loved Jesus so much. And uh, she shared that with me over and over again. And I know right now her mind is clear, mm -hmm. and that she is so happy because she needed no one in her life but Jesus, and she told me that over and over again. And she's looking down, and she's going to see this video, so he'll let me play that for you. That's her there. That was her just a couple, couple years ago. She was never in your playhouse. But there she was, so small and hiding inside you. You felt you had nowhere to turn. They said you have options. No one will even know she was ever there. 
But you chose life. When you close your eyes, could you see her smiles and hear her laughter? Did you know she will grow up and have babies at her own? <laughs> and when she looks onto their eyes, she will see a little piece of you. Did you ever imagine your grandchildren? Could you see their future in their eyes? Did you know they will grow up and have babies at their own? <laughs> Did you know they will live the last few days? <laughs> when you closed your eyes all those years ago, did you imagine me? Did you know I love to sing? <laughs> Could you see me dancing? Did you know you didn't say just one life? You saved generations. Even you never imagined us, here we are. Seven harmonies, seven voices. I all want to say thank you to choosing life. We won't be here without you.